pleasure to host Ryan Peck here today to be blocking. So he's the expert on galactic magnetic fields. In fact, one of the key persons in LOFAR and, and also the future SKA. And he got his doctor at the University of Bonn in 79. And then to up the hill basically to the Max Planck and Ferrari real astronomy from 80 to 83 in order to then move to Heidelberg to the MBIK for the next three years and then he got a staff position back in Bonn at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy and stayed since then. He did a lot of beautiful work on magnetic fields and galaxies and we are it's a pleasure to yeah listen to your talk today. So, Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Thank you for coming. So I will uh, talk about what I've done during my last 40 years. If you, as you have seen, I did not change my field of, of uh, research. So I was advised by my thesis supervisor that magnetic fields may be something interesting. And he was right. And I found this so interesting that I'm working uh, on this since then. And uh, I will present you some of the results. Of course, I cannot present you all the results because it would take me a few hours, so I'll try to be uh, brief and just concentrate on the most important things. But I also want to remind uh, you that uh, I have some special uh, connection to Heidelberg, not only that I work with Heinz Volk, who uh, I'm very grateful that he's also among the audience today uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Current Physics, but we also had a, a meeting, and it was IAU Symposium number 140 in the Max Planck class, and this in fact was the first I use symposium on galactic and extragalactic magnetic fields. So this I organized together with Phil Kronberg and with uh, Richard Lewinsky. So Heidelberg has a magnetic uh, history. Uh, and, uh, so why do we uh, work on magnetic fields? So there are several reasons for that. So magnetic fields are easy to generate because most of the visible matter in the universe is ionized. Magnetic fields are diff difficult to destroy because we have non-magnetic monopoles. There was one some time ago that was withdrawn, so officially there are no magnetic monopoles and uh, unfortunately magnetic fields need, need illumination, so they are difficult to observe. And I will not go into all the details, uh, procedures of observation, so it will also take two hours, so there are many different methods to observe magnetic fields, either in the optical or infrared, the light emission, uh, but most methods and the most powerful ones are in the radio. This is synchrotron intensity, totally polarized in Faraday rotation. And I will give you some examples of that uh, during my talk. But also because of uh, giving some history of my connections to Heidelberg, I want to remember to uh, remind uh, uh, Christian that what we have done a long time ago. On Carl Alto 1 meter telescope, we tried to observe uh, magnetic fields with help of starlight polarization. These are just two examples from uh, two of our papers. This is the galaxy 6946, this is a spiral galaxy, and 891 is an hadron galaxy. And as you can see, it's, it's not completely obvious whether we really detected magnetic fields, which should have some spiral shape here. Uh, there's obviously some distortion here, and the problem in the optical is always are you seeing uh, dust grains aligned by magnetic fields, or are you seeing scattered light? Scattered light is also polarized, but it has nothing to do with magnetic fields. And especially in this case, in 891, we were very suspicious ourselves because it indicates a magnetic field is vertical. And that was some, something like a surprise. And uh, I will show you later the uh, radio image, and now I'm not completely sure whether we were incorrect. I think, in, in fact, we were correct in what we see here is vertical fields probably really existed, exist, and maybe we were right to say these are very magnetic fields we can see here. But since then, not much has been done in optical polarization. It's very hard, very difficult to do, not only because of the scattered light, but also because of, uh, of uh, time you need at the telescope, and uh, there's very few attempts uh, to continue that uh, with larger telescopes and maybe different spectral ranges. And also I gave up with optical, and also Christian gave up with that, and we moved to other fields, and uh, I moved back to, uh, to radio astronomy. 
Uh, just for truth, also mention another connection to, uh, to this city, to the MPIA uh, on Königstuhl, that there was a famous paper by Lee and Henning uh, and showed that uh, using the Goldberg Kilofis effect, which is the uh, polarization of the CO line, uh, comparing that with Fatemis, uh, Fatemis also here, radio map of M33 shows that obviously the, uh, the, uh, the line of the, um, of the, uh, of the, kilo, of the uh, CO line is at either 90 degrees or uh, 0 degrees with respect to the radio polarization. And this is exactly what you would expect in case of a uh, molecular, uh, magnetic field molecular cloud which are aligned along the spiral lines because the goldrecht kilofis effect has an ambiguity of 90 degrees. So that shows that the magnetic field on large scales which has been observed in the radio are, are uh, the same as what you can see in the molecular gas. Also this is very tricky and very difficult uh, business to do. So now the rest of my talk I will talk about uh, radio synchrotron emission. So radio synchrotron emission is uh, is just a radio continuum map of a galaxy. This is a uh, one galaxy 6946. I will show uh, more often during my talk. This is a combination of uh, two radio telescopes, Effersburg telescope and the VLA. And important is that the radio uh, synchrotron intensity depends on the density of cosmic ray electrons, on the magnetic field strength, and on the frequency, an integral over the line of sight. So this is the spectral index of the cosmic rays, and this is typically between 2.5 and 3, most cases around 3, so this gives you a dependence of, uh, of about 2, and this gives you a dependence of about minus 1. So it, is, it depends on the high power of the magnetic field strength, and also frequency dependent. The problem is if you want to measure the magnetic field strength from the synchrotron intensity, you have to assume something about the cosmic ray, the density of the cosmic ray electrons. This is difficult. We have, don't have uh, only in very few cases independent information about the cosmic ray electrons. So what we normally do, we assume, assume so-called equipartition. We assume that the density, energy density of the cosmic rays and that of the magnetic field are equal, and then we can compute magnetic field strength, what we call equipartition magnetic field strength. This is a recent Example of uh, David Mulcahy, they have done with the LOFAR telescope. In fact, it's the only LOFAR picture I have time to show today. This is also, uh, this is an optical picture from the Carla Alto, I don't know which telescope, so somebody should tell me later which telescope that has been taken with. This is a roughly the same scale of the radio image, so the radio image is, is larger, shows a large halo around M51, and this color scale is the magnetic field strength. So at the center, we have around 35 microgauss and then the spiral arms around 20, between the spiral arms around 15, and in the outer part uh, that decreases to around 10 microgauss. And beyond 10 microgauss, the sensitivity is not sufficient. The magnetic field certainly will not stop here, it will extend further, but we cannot measure that anymore. So, uh, from this equipartition and the intensity of synchrotron, we can estimate that typically in spiral arms, magnetic fields are of the order of 10 microgauss up to uh, 20 microgauss for the total field, and in starburst galaxies it can be up, up to 100 microgauss, and the filaments of central regions of galaxies can be up to milligauss. All that are uh, lower limits, they can be larger if cosmic rays they suffer from energy losses, but in most cases these are just uh, appropriate, uh, approximate values which uh, are useful uh, uh, to consider. The polarized radio emission looks completely different. So this is the same galaxy, 6946 seen in total, and the polarized uh, radio emission is exactly the same observations for the same telescopes. And you see that in the optical it's a more amorphous disk of radio emission in the, in the radio shows this nice magnetic arms, which I will discuss later. So uh, these trace all the magnetic fields, this traces the total magnetic field, and the two can be completely different. So polarization shows us shows something completely different. And the final method I want to introduce is Faraday rotation. Faraday rotation um, rotates the polarization plane. If the emission, synchrotron emission, passes through a magnetized cloud, and according to the energy, uh, the, the thermal 
density of the electrons and the magnetic field strength in this cloud, uh, the rotation, uh, the, the, uh, the polarization plane is rotated according to the rotation measure, and the rotation measure is a product of the uh, line of sight magnetic field and the thermal electron density within this cloud that also depends on square of the wavelength. And this Rn is called the Faraday rotation measure. So the Faraday rotation measure is another independent measure of the magnetic field strength. Unfortunately, not alone, the thermal electron density is also uh, embedded here. So one also has to do a separation of these two to get an independent measure of the magnetic field strength from the rotation measure. And um, one other important, um, uh, important fact is if you observe polarization vectors like here, then you don't know whether this field here, this ordered field, is really unidirectional, like here, which we call a regular field, or whether the field has lots of reversals. That's, we call this an anisotropic turbulent field. It is in fact a turbulent field because it reverses its sign frequently, but it has been, it has been, uh, has been made anisotropic by compression or shear or any other processes. So in polarization you cannot distinguish, both of them give strong polarization. But Faraday rotation is sensitive to the sign, so here Faraday rotation is strong, but in this case Faraday rotation cancels and Faraday rotation is very low. So to distinguish these two you need additionally Faraday rotation measurements. Polarization is not sensitive to the sign of the magnetic field. So altogether we have four components of the field, we have the total field, the isotropic turbulent field, which gives unpolarized radio emission, the anisotropic turbulent field, which gives us polarized emission, and then we have the regular magnetic field or coherent field, which gives us polarization and Faraday rotation. And the sum uh, is just the square of these three components, which give the fourth, the fourth magnetic field component listed here. And finally, uh, at the end of, of introducing the methods, so I cannot resist introducing you a completely new method in radio astronomy, which will revolutionize the analysis of radio data completely. So we are able to do spectral polarimetry now in radio continuum. We call this arm synthesis. So if we measure the Stokes parameters Q and U as a function of wavelength, then by a simple Fourier transform, we can convert these data cubes into data cubes uh, as, a, as, a, as a function of so-called Faraday depth phi. And the Faraday depth contains a lot of information about the 3D structure of the magnetic field along the line of sight. And this is just an example. I have no time to go into details. So this is a big, huge uh, bubble on the sky. And this is a four slices of a data cube. Is a different Faraday depth, so this is like slices in the data cube, and you see that this big bubble is really becoming smaller and smaller. You have a tomographic view of this bubble with one single image here. We have no idea what this bubble is. It is huge on sky several degrees, maybe related to a star or whatever. It's a magnetized bubble seen only by applying this tomographic view. And now we are learning and hopefully learn a lot about this for future uh, for the studies uh, of, of uh, this other synthesis. Okay, so this was an uh, introduction into the methods and now I want to show you a uh, few results and examples of what we have done with this method. So the first message to you is magnetic fields are important. And uh, so they are not just some byproduct of galaxies, they, are, they play an important role and I will later give also some concrete examples. So to know whether some quantity in physics is important, uh, the easiest way is to study, to compare the energy densities. So I will not talk about gravitation because gravitation is not directly affecting magnetic fields. Um, I will only talk about the magnetic energy density, the kinetic one of the gas, which is mainly the turbulent uh, uh, motion of the gas, and the thermal uh, energy density. So we can measure all these, so we know B from equipartition, we can measure uh, N from molecular clouds, we can measure uh, the turbulent velocity from the dispersion of molecular clouds, and we can measure the temperature of the gas, and we can compare this 
different quantities. And the result, which has been confirmed for several other galaxies, is that the magnetic field energy density and the one of the kinetic turbulence are similar. Possibly magnetic field is uh, even dominating in the outer parts of the galaxy. In both of them, they are an order of magnitude higher than the thermal energy density of the ionized gas. The thermal energy density of the cold gas is even weaker. So this means uh, the, the general plasma in galaxies is a so-called low beta plasma. It has a much higher energy density of the magnetic field compared to that of the thermal. And this is surprising. And that also means that the, that the turbulence is supersonic, at least one average over this very large scale. And that is important because it seems that magnetic field and turbulence are, have some intimate relation to each other. And in fact, we believe that that the magnetic field is, uh, is uh, amplified and, uh, and also partly generated by turbulence. So turbulence is a, is a critical and is a crucial uh, 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 method, uh, process to produce uh, magnetic fields. So then uh, the most beautiful radio uh, object on skies, Andromeda galaxy. And from Andromeda we can learn a lot about magnetic fields. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy in the radio has a bright ring here. It's a bright ring with polarization which follows almost perfectly this ring here. The field strength on average is 6 microgauss and in polarization the extent is even further. So this is a new Effensburg survey by uh, René Bissigl and the ordered fields extend out to more than 25 kiloparsecs. So this is the deepest survey we ever made for the Effensburg telescope and it shows that magnetic fields probably extend extremely far out in a galaxy. And uh, that may be important uh, to not to explain rotation curves, so nobody really believes that magnetic fields are, so, are strong enough to explain why rotation curves of the gas are flat, but uh, that has been studied by some sp uh, colleagues in Spain, that, that some, some small detail in the rotation curve, like in M31, beyond 20 kiloparsec, the rotation curve increases again. And this is a model here with the magnetic field taken from our observations. It may be that magnetic forces can explain at least part of the rotation curve. If it's rising, that could be due to magnetic forces. But magnetic forces certainly cannot replace dark matter, so this is for sure. There were some ideas in the past that maybe we don't need dark matter if we have magnetic fields that does not work. But so there are tiny effects, but they are maybe observable. So zooming in into M31, there's a very interesting part of the ring here. Inside there's another spiral here. This spiral is a, uh, is a separate dynamo. There's a, there's a separate production of magnetic fields here in the inner part here. Uh, which is, which is, uh, which is diff different from the outer parts. If you now further zoom in, this is the Effelsberg uh, telescope, which is zoom into this brightest part here, and go over to the VLA, which is a uh, higher resolution telescope, then we see this, this wiggling magnetic field here in that arm. So this is again this brightest part, just turned uh, by about 50 degrees. And together with the Faraday rotation, which also has this periodicity, we can say that this is a helical field. So helical fields are something which are naturally uh, produced by any sort of, of magnetic field uh, mechanism, by the dynamo or by Parker instabilities. And this is a very clear case of a helical field on scales of uh, resolution is 100 parsecs. This is uh, about 2 kiloparsec length. So we see this only in the brightest part, but if we would have the resolution and the sensitivity, we probably would see this in uh, many, other, many other places. This Andromeda galaxy gave the strongest hint so far that what we see here in polarization indeed is produced by a dynamo. In case of a dynamo, we would expect that uh, the magnetic field is is really the pointing inwards of the galaxy everywhere or outwards everywhere and it's closing out in the halo of the galaxy and if so, if we uh, observe the rotation measure looking along uh, the magnetic field here and uh, away from the magnetic field points away from here, if we go around here we see a sinusoidal variation. There could be also other patterns of magnetic fields, so-called bisometric fields, where the field goes inside and goes outside. In that case, we will see 
double variability. So like a Fourier analysis of the rotation measure along the azimuthal angle going around in the galaxy should show us what is the large scale pattern. And if we find this one or this one, we are relatively set and sure that this could be uh, driven by a dynamo because there is no other mechanism known so far which can produce such a pattern, simple pattern of magnetic fields. And indeed Andromeda shows exactly what is expected, so there is positive rotation measure here, negative there, so the magnetic field is not only oriented around the ring, it is also directed around the ring. Now I can plot arrows here, this is just a polarization, I don't know whether the field goes left or right here, I know it goes, goes to the right, it goes around here. And that is a very clear signature of a dynamo to be more precise in the mean field dynamo. Unfortunately, there is no other nice case like this one found so far, so we are lucky that Andromeda gives us such a nice uh, and, and simple example. So if this is a dynamo, can we confirm this by, by modeling? Uh, yes, we can. So this is a model by a Polish group, by Michal Hanasz. So you start with some seed field here, and then already after 7 times 10 to the 8 years, you start, you see that that the polarities, uh, blue and red, are starting to emerge, and so there are some filamentary structs, spiral structures, and uh, after five giga years, then, then uh, one of the polarities has one, and one polarity is prevailing, and this is exactly what we see, there is one polarity left over only. Which, which ones, whether it's the blue or the red one, is completely by chance. So it depends on, on some critical <coughs> Uh, state in the beginning of the galaxy where it becomes, becomes uh, this polarity. So it seems that the dynamo is really able to produce out of a seed field uh, a nicely coherent uh, regular magnetic field. This is a, a relatively simplistic model. There are more uh, sophisticated models which uh, say, okay, the real life is not that easy. There are frequent uh, distortions, so there is ejection of random fields by star formation and differential rotation can be strong or less strong. In that case, you see the other polarity either in the outer parts, like here, so one polarity wins, but there is some remains of the other polarity. But you can also have, um, for very high differential rotation, two polarities at the same time. So you can see so-called field reversals. So the field may reverse from here to here and again from here to here. And there are claims that in the Milky Way, for instance, these reversals are observed. So that is not a perfect dynamo, but it's a realistic dynamo. So this is how magnetic fields probably really look like. And I should also mention the models by, by Rüdiger Kackner and Volker Springer also here. And, uh, so they also, in their models, uh, MHD, by, uh, driven by the magnetic rotational instability, uh, able to produce spiral fields Although they don't include the mean field dynamo, uh, because of technical reasons that cannot be included here. So they don't get a mean field here, uh, like the dynamo can get, but they also get a spiral field, still with reversals. And this is something we have to still to discuss, uh, how to uh, improve this, and maybe these are models which are, can show uh, galaxies, uh, field patterns in galaxies, not much more realistically than the simple mean field. So, um, back to um, nicer, nice examples. So, the second nicest example of a, of a magnetic field in the galaxy is M51, where we can also learn uh, several new things. Uh, so, M51 is almost phased on, so we don't see a ring or something uh, strongly inclined, but we see the spiral structure, and then we can here study for the first time in detail. How is a magnetic field related to the spiral arms? The first thing we see is that the magnetic field follows the spiral arms. But if we look in, into detail, then the, the strongest, so the longest vectors which correspond to the strongest ordered magnetic fields are in between, they are not on the spiral arms. This is a more precise plot here. So the, the, the black and white, the total intensity, which is the turbulent field mainly, and the and the vectors and the contours are the polarized intensity, you see they are shifted with, with respect to the spiral arms to the inner part. Here. And here also there's a, there's, a, there's a shift here. There's also one component along the spiral arm, it's probably density wave compression, but there's this feature here, which we call a magnetic arm, which is completely offset from anything else we see in the gas 
uh, and in, uh, in, the, in the total magnetic field. And even more dramatic is 6946, where these magnetic arms are in the interarm regions offset from the optical spiral arms. And that was a complete surprise. The dynamo could not explain that. And in fact, there are many, many different models, and there's no really good model how uh, it can happen that the old magnetic field is concentrated in the interarm regions here. So, and uh, 6946 told us a lot of, 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 of other things, and uh, thanks to uh, Fatimi, uh, we know that, uh, for instance, the uh, turbulent magnetic field, this is for um, 6946, I, I don't remember what the second oh, yeah, this is the total field, this is the turbulent field here. Uh, they are correlated to the star formation rate that indicates that indeed uh, the turbulent magnetic field is produced by kinetic energy density of the turbulence, but the orbit magnetic field has no correlation with star formation at all. So the turbulent field doesn't care what the star formation does, it is uh, completely random. So this we believe we understand, this is a so-called small-scale dynamo on a magnetic field produced out of turbulence, and this one we do not understand at all. So we have until now no idea what determines the, uh, the orders of magnetic fields. And the relation is, uh, so there's a low power, so the turbulent field is related to the star formation rate to 0 1, 0.16. So 6946 shows also a, a pattern, a characteristic pattern in the Faraday rotation. The Faraday rotation is positive here, and it is negative here. That's quite interesting because uh, that is a mode which can also be produced by the dynamo. Uh, so there could be, this magnetic arm could be a mean field dynamo, but it could be also many other things, so many models how to explain this, uh, this strange behavior of the Faraday rotation in the magnetic arms, but none of these models are really convincing. So we need to work more on that. So there could be slow energy D waves, dynamo, as I said, could be a coupling between dance to wave and dynamo, injection of turbulent field or suppression of the dynamo action. So these are all ideas which are in the air, but none of them has been proven to be correct. I will skip over that. And thus very freshly, so this is one of our latest work, is another galaxy you may not know, you may not heard of, have heard about after the famous galaxies M31 and M33. This is the, large, the largest galaxy on the sky, the nearest. It is as large as the moon on sky, it's half a degree. I see 342, it's not well known because it's behind the galactic plane. And uh, it looks rather chaotic, so there's not that nice spiral structure. But if you move to, to so this is the uh, overlay of the polarization. Again, the polarization follows the spiral arms, but it's shifted. So here are the optical spiral arm, the vectors are in between. Here's the optical spiral arm, and here the vectors again are between. And that's how it looks in, in color scale. So we see these magnetic filaments also here, these narrow things which are disconnected from the optical arms. So we have very little idea what this could be. And I could just show you many more examples. Uh, so we have found many of these which uh, we still have to understand. So this is all um, indicating that there is some connection between the gas, turbulent gas, gas flows, and magnetic fields, but. Uh, Still, the question is, is that all some of some uh, theoretical interest or is it important? So, would models of galaxies be incomplete without magnetic fields? In other words, so do we really need to include magnetic fields? Are they dynamically important? And the evidence is not that large, but there are a few cases where uh, there is indication. So first, from a theoretical point of view, there are indications that deep magnetic fields are important. So this is work by Price and Bates, so there are several papers showing that if you have magnetic fields, star formation is affected. They have less cloud fragmentation for strong fields, you have less efficient star formation if the fields are strong, you have less low mass stars, and you have less binary stars for strong magnetic fields. So the star formation process clearly is affected by magnetic fields. So I'm not an expert on this one, but I know that there are many experts in various institutes of the city who know more, much more about this uh, than, than I do. So magnetic fields for star formation are clearly very important and need to be considered. <coughs> what about the formation of spiral structures? So this is 
beta 10 to the 6 no magnetic fields, beta beta 0.1 is very strong magnetic fields. And you see that the formation of spiral structures are really sorry are really different uh, for for the different magnetic fields uh, important. So with strong magnetic fields, spiral arms are much much smoother than with our magnetic fields. So does it mean that magnetic fields are producing nice spiral structures? Possibly yes. So we have to consider also magnetic fields in the formation of spiral structures. And uh, Rüdiger has shown uh, has found indication that uh, that are opposite to that. So there seems to be some contradiction. So this is on small scale, so when the spiral arms are more smooth. But Rudiger has shown that uh, with magnetic fields, uh, spiral structures are more patchy. This is uh, without magnetic fields, this is with magnetic fields. So on large scales, the opposite seems to be the case. The star formation is lower, the strong vertical outflows, but the spiral structure itself seems to be less smooth than the first one. So this is something we still have to discuss or I would like to understand. So why are different models producing different uh, results on that? So just an um, idea that maybe the formation of spiral arms is affected by, uh, by spiral uh, by magnetic fields. Barred galaxies also show us how magnetic field can affect the gas flow. So this is uh, 1097, it's one of the largest but the Alex is on sky, and here we found polarization which is along the dust lanes. There are dust lanes here. There is a flow of gas in a bar galaxy into the bar. There is a shock front here which produces this nice, this strong uh, uh, radio emission here. But there is a, obviously a flow. There's not a, not a, a shock like a sudden kick here. There is a smooth <coughs> flow into the bar, and that flow is uh, is traced by the magnetic field. But the magnetic field is so strong that the flow is obviously also affected by the magnetic field. So this flow in, in the gas in the bar potentially of a, of a galaxy is clearly uh, strongly affected by magnetic fields. Then we move into this part here, which is overexposed here, and uh, zoom this, uh, zoom into this one. This is a this is a starburst region. This is a strongly star-forming central ring within this galaxy. This is a VOT image. This is a radio image, it also shows a nice ring in the turbulent field, which is unpolarized, and the polarized is different, the polarization shows a spiral structure. And if you do the calculation how strong is the field, uh, 60 microgauss, what would be the dynamical effect, then you come to the surprising result if you compute magnetic stresses uh, following uh, 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 classical uh, hydro uh, uh, Natural hydrodynamics in a very simple estimate here. Uh, then, if you plug in the numbers, you get an accretion rate of the gas by magnetic stresses of about one solar mass per year. And this is needed to feed this beast here in the middle, which is an active galactic nucleus. And people are always worried so, how can you get enough gas into the nucleus to make it bright? Because the gas is rotating, rotating nicely around. Uh, the black hole, and you see there are obviously some, some flow into the black hole, and these flow uh, um, dust planes are obviously magnetic, and they help the gas to flow into that, and that could explain why uh, there is gas flow, and also explain why this AGM is bright. And there has been uh, modeling in, in the meantime, and they confirm that a deep magnetic field can, uh, can do the job. And now coming finally to, uh, to Adron galaxies, also in Adron galaxies we have learned a lot about the connection between galaxies in the intergalactic medium. So first is, there are magnetic fields, if you look at galaxies Adron, are not perfectly along the plane. They are strong vertical uh, filaments. And this is again a man one which uh, Christian and I have observed a long time ago. You see this X shape here, but this is low resolution. So in fact, this is a superposition of a magnetic field along the plane and vertical field. And what we have observed in optical polarization may be right that there is a vertical field component. And in projection, as a vector addition of the two components, you see this, this uh, smooth pattern. But obviously, there is something going out. And there is a forming a big radio halo here. And this, we call this galactic wind. And the galactic wind, if it occurs in all galaxies, and probably it does, 
can magnetize the intergalactic medium out of very large radio. I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. So, in summary, for uh, what we have learned about uh, magnetic fields in nearby galaxies, so they are uh, uh, the, uh, the orbit fields are spiral, so they are compressed if they are strong density waves, but uh, most cases they are concentrated in interarm regions, sometimes forming magnetic arms. Faraday rotation reveals large scale regular fields which probably are generated by a main field dynamo. There are no large scale reversals found between spiral arms so far, which is also a surprise. Irregular fields, I did not show them. Uh, they also host uh, turbulent field, but no uh, ordered fields. And in elliptical, quiet elliptical galaxies, we could not detect any uh, magnetic fields so far. If they are active and become radio galaxies, of course, then we have lots of magnetic fields. So, uh, interacting galaxies is also something I would like to, to present you because this is probably what many optical astronomers are interested in to learn about. Uh, how galaxies do evolve and interactions are very frequent. And the famous, most famous one is the Antenna Galaxy 4038-39. And here we found that the strongest ordered fields are in this compression region. The resolution is not very high. It's a very distant galaxy, more than 30 megaparsecs away, but here is the, the strongest polarization. This is a region where there is no star formation yet. It is a compression region. And this is the location of future star formation. So this is the actual star formation. This is a very dense clump where the two galaxies collide. And so we can predict from the compression of the magnetic field that they are the next uh, phase of star burst of star formation will occur. And also in, in interacting uh, groups of galaxies, like the Stefan's quintet, we found a lot of polarized emission in between the galaxies. Also shows up that there are shocks uh, and uh, and uh, merges between galaxies and they compress the field so you can use the uh, radio emission as a tracer of these, uh, of these interactions of magnetic fields. And even in a, if you're, you can even do more, this is, looks like a completely normal undisturbed galaxy in the optical. This is in a Virgo cluster and in the Virgo cluster there is a strong intra-cluster medium so the galaxy is moving with high speed through this medium with a few hundred kilometers per second or even thousand kilometers per second and that comp should compress the gas. It's very hard to see in the optical, you would see that this is slightly more compressed here than here, but in the radio you see this enormously strong <coughs> peak of polarized emission on one side of the galaxy, which indicates that indeed this is a, <coughs> a RAM pressure compression uh, <coughs> by the, the intra-cluster gas that the galaxy is moving through. Okay, so and finally I would uh, like now to give you some, some prospects. So you may say this is an uh, interesting result, but finally what we want to prove is that magnetic fields are some not only important but a crucial uh, ingredient of galaxies and for the evolution of galaxies magnetic fields are important. Maybe we are wrong, but we have to test that. And this is why we uh, want a, a telescope which has higher sensitivity and also um, a higher resolution. And this is why at the end of my talk I would like to introduce you to the square kilometer array, which we call the ultimate radio telescope of the 21st century. So a uh, new telescope which is bigger, which is more uh, sensitive than anything else, is uh, very expensive, it has to be large. So it cannot be afforded by one community, it should be a global observatory. So as many countries involved as possible and uh, because it will be global it should not be at one site it is, uh, has been decided to build it on two different continents the funding should be worldwide and the infrastructure research infrastructure should also be spread worldwide so uh, the technology is extremely difficult it is difficult in, in terms of computing power of storage power and also of uh, just pure uh, um, power of uh, energy consumption, um, but it has the potential for really doing new science. So we would like to answer some of the fundamental questions, but with a, such a big new telescope, you probably will discover things which you did not think before. So discoveries are the really important things. So if you really uh, build a new one, then you should be able to see 
things you have never imagined before. So what are the goals? So resolution better than one half second. Sensitivity should be very high, so we give this in square uh, meters per Kelvin, so if the receiver temperature is low, we can afford for less collective area. If the uh, receiver temperature is not very good, we need a larger collecting area. So this is about 100 times better uh, than the Effensburg telescope. A large frequency coverage, so from 50 megahertz to 40 gigahertz. A large field of view, this is something which is really challenging, at least one square degree. Hopefully, uh, at some frequencies, even hundreds square degrees. And it should be able to do polarization, otherwise we cannot do our magnetic field uh, work. So what is the present concept? All the frequency range to do it in one run, it's impossible. So we have to use at least two types of, of antennae. And uh, at the moment, this is the concept for the low antennae between 50 and 350 megahertz. Uh, so this is, as you can see, looks like the Australian desert. And, Indeed, it should be going to Western Australia and uh, in, the, in the mid frequency range, which we really, uh, possibly goes up to 14 gigahertz, not yet decided. We use parabolic dishes. So we need thousands of them. You can see them at the horizon. So they should be cheap and they should be as sensitive as possible. And that is something that's sort of like a development of a, of a TV uh, dishes, which is almost certainly will be built by some Chinese company and, uh, and this is the uh, location of this one will be in, in South Africa. So there will be two sites, South Africa and Australia. Um, Australia also has already a telescope uh, which is called the ASCAP telescope and to expand that the idea is to have an SKA survey, so a third type of telescope which is a really wide uh, uh, field of view up to 10, 20 square degrees or so. So there are two sides, but three different uh, types of telescopes. But that drives us into a trouble because the, the cost cap, uh, which has been defined by the funding agencies of the participating countries, is 600 million euro. So for the moment, there are 12 countries which are participating. So something has to probably be deleted, maybe one of these concepts, maybe all the concepts will be reduced, so we still do not know what will happen and that will be decided until the middle of next year. If everything runs well, then the construction should start in 2017. So there are two phases, so the first phase, um, the main emphasis is on, on the history of the neutral hydrogen and testing the theories of gravitation. And then the second phase, then the really sensitive uh, experiments should go like measuring the dark energy and increasing <coughs> magnetism. Uh, so we have to wait a bit. So in the first phase, we can do already some good science, but so for the really interesting magnetism science, we'll probably have to wait a few more years. So our questions are: so what do we really want to know about magnetic fields in the universe? When were the first magnetic fields generated? So did magnetic fields already exist before galaxies were formed? So how fast, how and how fast were they amplified in galaxies? And um, how did they affect the evolution of galaxies and galaxy clusters? Right? Is intergalactic space generally magnetic? So these are our goals. And um, so go to the evolution of galaxies. The first question is how, how deep into space can we see with the SKA? So this is redshift here. These are two, two types of galaxies, a very bright one, a starburst one, and then a, a weaker one like our Milky Way. So this is, a, this is a shallow observation, 10 hours with a full SKA or 100 hours with SKA1. This is a really deep observation. And you can see that Milky Way type galaxies can be seen uh, until redshift of roughly 2, but the bright ones can be seen forever. Uh, so when they were when they formed at redshift of some. So the SKA can really look into the, into the whole universe, into the formation at least of the brighter uh, galaxies here. So what do we expect from dynamo models? So we expect that indeed the very distant galaxies already have magnetic fields because of the turbulent dynamo, which is very fast. So at redshifts of 5 or lower, we should have already supercombination. Polarization needs a bit more time. It needs to be some organization. It takes time. That means polarization you cannot expect. Uh, earlier than that shift of 2 to 3. 
and large scale patterns are fully organized magnetic fields in galaxies. This comes a little later, that probably is only relatively recent in the nearby universe. So, with SKA, because we are able to go onto these redshifts, we are able to uh, trace the evolution of magnetic fields uh, during with the, with the SKA. And uh, there's one very interesting aspect of that, which uh, recently has been studied by Dominik Schleicher in, in Göttingen. Uh, you know, I have briefly mentioned that there is a close connection between the radio and the infrared emission of a galaxy. And that means that uh, the radio uh, emission comes from processes which are related to star formation. This is what we believe is the turbulent dynamo plus the production of cosmic ray electrons. And if this is uh, the case, then uh, the ratio of infrared to radio should increase with redshift. This is the uh, infrared radio ratio, so this is expected. From, from these models here, and these are the observations. And the observations show that this is not the case. So the ratio is decreasing, that means the radio at high redshift is even stronger than expected. And this is a surprise, that means in the early galaxies the magnetic fields are even stronger than we would extrapolate from today. But there is a limitation. If you go to higher and higher redshifts, then uh, you are fighting with the inverse Compton process, and the inverse Compton process can be described by an um, equivalent magnetic field, which is 3 microgauss times 1.7 squared. So if we go to very high redshifts, then the magnetic field has to overcome this number here, so that you see it's superpop at all. If the magnetic field is not strong enough, inverse Compton dominates, and then the radio emission breaks down completely. So it's some redshift, because you see the, this equivalent number goes really strongly with redshift. You should then, at some redshift, really see a breakdown of the radio emission. So by just observing this ratio of uh, infrared over radio with redshift, you can say something about the evolution of magnetic fields. And that Dominic Schleicher has uh, studied together with me uh, last year in a, in a paper. So just this ratio tells us something about the evolution of magnetic fields. So going with the SKA, we can, we can uh, have other methods to look for distant galaxies. And this is a, another very nice example. This is a regular galaxy, Fornax A. These are the two big blobs here. So this is nothing special. It is uh, as you expect for a radio galaxy. Now we switch on into polarization. So polarization looks already completely different. It's filamentary. Then you see something there. If you zoom, there's a galaxy in the middle. So this galaxy here produces a, a shadow, a, a Faraday shadow uh, of the background emission. So if there's background polarized emission and there's a galaxy in front, then this galaxy produces a signature. So this galaxy is not seen directly, it's seen indirectly. This is seen optically because it's relatively nearby, but we could apply this method even for much, much more distant objects, we can see absorption, follow the absorption of distant galaxies with the SKA. There's another method, if you go to really very distant objects like quasars, so quasars can be at redshifts of 5 or even 10, and then you study uh, the, uh, the surroundings of these quasars, and uh, if there are enough quasars around, then you may see that the, the light of these quasars is, is affected by Faraday rotation, and this, uh, this uh, region of, of affecting the, uh, the polarized light of that quasar is it's very strong, uh, around 40, 50 kiloparsecs, and then is decreasing down. And these authors, it's Martin Werner from Zurich University, ETH Zurich, claim that what we're seeing here is a, is a foreground object in front of the quasar, which is uh, affecting uh, the polarized light, and this size of this foreground object is 50 kiloparsecs. And they're claiming that this is a galaxy in front of the quasar, and that galaxy has a magnetized halo of 50 kiloparsecs. So this is true, and we have to really revise our ideas about, uh, about the extent of, of galaxies. So these intervening galaxies, as they are called, they are not directly visible, only via the Faraday effect, they may be very frequent in the universe. And this is clearly a very interesting topic for the SKA. 
And, uh, and finally, one more important example of what we can do with the FPA, we need high resolution. So small scale magnetic fields, are they really related to star forming regions as uh, expected uh, by the, uh, by the uh, turbulent dynamo process or directly related to the gas clouds? And there recently has been a claim by the group of, of Eva Shinera, who unfortunately could not be here uh, tonight, that uh, this, is the, uh, this is the radio image, this is the uh, CO image from uh, um, Plateau de Bure, that uh, they say that the coupling uh, between radio and CO is better than between radio and the infrared. And they, are, they claim that there is a direct coupling between magnetic fields and gas clouds. Could be also secondary cosmic rays from molecular clouds, but this is, a, of course, a more interesting thing. So that should be followed, that maybe there is a direct connection, that magnetic fields are directly coupled to gas clouds, and from that we need higher resolution observations, SKA, and combined with an observation. So maybe our ideas have to be revised if we really go to extremely high resolution, 60 parsecs or that. Okay, skip over that. And, um, come to the conclusions. So, in the SKA community we have different working groups and we have a science team for magnetism and uh, so this is our, our priorities for the SKA. We want to do an old sky survey of fire the rotation measures um, and find these interveners and find lots of, uh, of background polarized sources. Then we want to do a deep survey and find distant galaxies in polarization and measure their rotation measures. And we want to look for intergalactic filaments, galactic clusters in interactive uh, galaxies. That has to be done at a lower frequency. And we want to do high resolution imaging of galaxies and uh, AGMs, uh, including polarization. And uh, all the science which can be done with the SKA will be summarized in a book that will be um, published uh, end of this year or probably early next year. Uh, that will not be a real book because uh, there are 180 chapters and each chapter is about 10 pages, so probably it will be only a virtual book on the web. So uh, 90 chapters are related to magnetic fields. So this is a fraction of magnetic fields and uh, as decided in very early on, but will we continue that indeed cosmic magnetism is a key science for the square kilometer array. So probably too late for me, but not for my students and not for you. So if you want to work on magnetism, this is the time to join uh, the group. And I think the prospects for observations of cosmic magnetism are excellent. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent talk, Reiner. So, as always, we will first have questions from students and postdocs. Yes. Okay. Um, so, you mentioned the, um, the effect that the magnetic fields might have on rotation curves. Um, and I assume that those are at the midpoint. Sorry? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I assume that those are at the midpoint of the galaxies for those rotation curves. Our rotation curves, uh, they, are, they can be measured only along the major axis of galaxies, and uh, so this is uh, a rotation in the midpoint. Uh, well, not necessarily. I mean, you can measure a rotation curve off of. You can measure like that, but this is, this, is, this is quite hard to do. Yeah. Right, yeah. So for some galaxies, it is, it, yes, it, it can be done right. right. Yeah. yeah, you're right. But, but then what I showed was, was, uh, was the midpoint. And so nobody's really looking into. Um, Getting the measurements above the midpoint. Yeah, I think there are, there are some groups trying to do that. Yeah. Okay. And it's known that the rotation uh, velocity decreases with, with, with the height of the plane, so there must be some interaction with the intergalactic medium. But uh, <coughs> yes, so that is very hard to measure and to extract any effect of the magnetic field is, is almost completely hopeless. So M31 is a, is a special case because there we can measure the rotation curve very far out because it's such a near object and we can have very sensitive measurements on there. There seems to be this, this kink in the rotation curve that goes up and down. So this is an obvious case where maybe magnetic fields play a role. between the spiral arms, and you said it's not really understood why, is that correct? Mm -hmm. yep. 
Thank you, Andrew, again. 